Okay, everyone, I think we'll get started. My name is Brett Labello, and I'm the Director of Regional History and Genealogy at Pikes Peak Library District. And I'd li like to say welcome to everyone. Uh, first of all, we'll do a couple of shout outs. Uh, first shout outs to Fayetteville, North Carolina, Woodbridge, Virginia, Canton, Michigan, to the Gold Room right here in Colorado Springs, and to everyone else that's joining us this evening. You can be anywhere tonight, and we're really happy that you're here with us, uh, spending the next hour or so with us, uh, learning about uh, invisible people of the Pikes Peak region. Um, it's my pleasure to, to welcome everyone to this event. Uh, this is one of our signature events here at PPLD's uh, Regional History and Genealogy team. Uh, it's very unique for an archive to be not just preserving the history that is within our walls, but also interpreting it and publishing it in a book form. So this is one of those really neat aspects for us and that we really get a kick out of is sharing this history with the, the community. So this is a great opportunity for us and we love it. Um, so it's, like I said, a, a great, great place for us. Um, on that note, I'd like to introduce our CEO and Chief Librarian, John Spears. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is, I think, the fourth or fifth time that I have been a part of one of our book releases. But I've been really honest when I say that there is something really exciting about this one. Um, other than the fact that we are doing it virtually for the first time, many of us from our houses, which is a little bit unique. But um, this is a really special book, I think, for the Pikes Peak Library District and for the Pikes Peak region. Um, prior to this book being published in 1990, there really wasn't a comprehensive history that was dedicated to the local African-American community in the Pikes Peak region. That was rectified, though, with the publication of John Stokes Holly's The Invisible People of the Pikes Peak Region, an Afro-American Chronicle. Now, Mr. Holly had uh, a pretty illustrious career here. And when he was the executive director of the Urban League of the Pikes Peak region, he recognized that there was a very significant gap in the, in the historical narrative, in, in the text that people could use to explore the Pikes Peak region. This wasn't something that was unusual, unfortunately, though, when it came to underrepresented groups, groups that had been active participants in the creation of a region, in the region's story, but that were unfortunately often absent from the written record of the communities that they had shaped. This wasn't unique just to the Pikes Peak region, but it was something that John Holly wanted to fix. And that was why he wrote this book. It was a very large undertaking um, because as with other books of this nature, the sources that scholars often utilized that they were lacking when it came to an adequate representation of material for African-American citizens. So he worked with a lot of groups to put this together. Um, he worked with a, a Lulu Pollard's organization, the Negro Historical Association. And probably more importantly, he sought out members of the African-American community who could contribute to the research, very often through the collection of oral histories. Without the stories that he collected, so much history of this region would have been lost. But it wasn't just uh, Lou Pollard's organization and other groups. He also worked with um, the Colorado Springs Pioneer Museum and, of course, the Pikes Peak Library District's local history department. He scoured newspapers, archives, pamphlets, and a, a bevy of other resources to try to aid him in his research efforts. Now, this book is special to the Pikes Peak Library District, not just because it fills a hole in the collective record of our region, but because it's tied to someone else that's very special at the Pikes Peak Library. And that was his wife, Ruth Olive Hill Holly. And many of you might be aware that uh, one of our branches um, on Murray and Platt is the Ruth Holly Library. And um, his wife was one of our branch managers. So together they recognize the value of the library as an institution and that we can be a positive change in the community. So as a librarian with the Pikes Peak Library District, Ruth Holly made countless contacts uh, within the community. And she was probably one of the most dedicated and genuine people 
that we have ever had the pleasure of having him, having employed here. And she was an inspiration for everyone that, that, that she came across. We're honored here at the Pikes Peak Library District to present the reprint of this original publication. And it is our fervent hope that this is gonna help illuminate the stories of the invisible people of the Pikes Peak region. And that these stories will enlighten readers with a more complete and representative history of the community that we serve. We had hoped that we could actually do this live from the Ruth Holly Library tonight. Um, but as we are uh, in what I am calling a, a, an extension of 2020, we had a complete and utter network outage and our entire internet connection is down, which is why we're all doing this from our living rooms. But it is our hope that you'll be able to visit the Ruth Holly Library and feel a little bit of the inspiration that we do when we walk through those doors. So now I would like to introduce um, Takia Jemison and Heather Jordan. Um, Akia Jemison is our cataloger in special collections and she's been with the district since 2015. She also serves as a board member of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society of Colorado Springs. She holds a master's in library science from North Carolina Central University and a bachelor of arts in history from Fayetteville State University. In her spare time, which I don't think she has much of, she's also an adjunct professor at the Denver University and the Mortgage College of Education. Heather Jordan is an archivist and she joined our team uh, in 2011. She's been a contributing author or editor for many of the regional history series books we have, including Big Wigs and Benefactors of the Pikes Peak Region, Disaster of the Pikes Peak Region, and Massacre, Murder, and Mayhem in the Rocky Mountain West. If you need to know one thing about our books, it is that we love alliteration in the titles. Um, Heather has also been a member of the Academy of Certified Archivists since 2013 and serves as a board member of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society of Colorado Springs. She holds a master's in information sciences from the University of Michigan with a focus in archives and library services. So once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you be, for being a part of this release of such a needed resource. And with that, I'll turn it over to Taki and Heather. Thank you. Hi, Takia. It looks like you are uh, you are muted right now. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. <laughs> well, hi everyone. How <laughs> that was awesome. Um, we would like to start things off by ex expressing appreciation to everyone that has been a part of our journey. We would like to thank Candace McKnight for helping us navigate the historical obstacles that we face, and being a consistent supporter and mentor to us throughout this process. Melissa Mitchell for her contributions to our snapshots, which you'll get more details about how she got involved with that later in the program. Kay Ishmael for allowing us to republish the chapter on the trailblazer Fannie Mae Duncan, and Ashley Cornelius for her beautiful poem about Ruth Holly. Um, we would also like to thank our amazing proofreaders who carefully read each page of this book to ensure that it's error-free as much as possible. So thank you, Emily Anderson, Brad Labello, Tony Miller, who's like our unofficial work grandma, Tony Morris, Chris Nickel, and William Bill Thomas for your hard work and dedication. We will also like to give a special thanks to Erin Barnes for her lovely cover design and Nina Kaberski for her scanning talents. A thanks is also due to the African American Historical and Genealogical Society of Colorado Springs, Colorado College's Special Collections, Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, the Denver Public Library, Noel Holly, Peggy Shivers, Rhonda Phillips Guy, Sharon Tunson, and the University of Chapel Hill's Wilson's Library for contributing photographs. Heather and I will be forever indebted to Noel Holly and Candace McKnight for allowing us to conduct oral history interviews with them for the new chapters in this book. Noel's insight to his family history and Candace's in interview on the founding of the Negro Historical Association and the African American Historical and Genealogical Society of Colorado Springs are priceless. We will also like to acknowledge that this would not have been completed without the help of Tim Blevins, who has patiently answered every single question that we've had throughout this process 
and he continues to answer them for us to this day. We are forever grateful. And we also wanna say thank you to the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, the friends of the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, and the friends of the Pikes Peak Library District for co-publishing this important piece of the Pikes Peak region's history. We will also like to give a special shout out to our family and friends that supported us through this process. And if we got on your nerves because we were stressed out, we so apologize, but thank you for loving us through this. And finally, we would like to express appreciation and gratitude to John Holly. This reprint wouldn't exist without the original. His passion and determination to bring the stories of invisible people to light will, will not be forgotten. And thank you for giving us this opportunity to continue your legacy with this work. Next slide. So John Holly's love for writing started when he was a young adult writing for a local black newspaper in his hometown of Houston. And as his career evolved, he became the director of the Urban League here in, the, in Colorado Springs. And while he, was, um, at, while he was a director of the Urban League, he began doing research on the black citizens who were completely ignored in the past by historians. So he got a goal to produce pamphlets to distribute throughout the community about the minority population. He wanted to break down these stereotypes and generalizations of minorities so that the people of Colorado Springs could get a better understanding of each other. And as his idea grew, he found out that there was a plethora of information from the Pioneers Museum, the library, and also the Negro Historical Association. So he began conducting community, he began conducting interviews throughout the community by collecting these stories from these black history makers that ended up being the original Pikes Peak, the invisible, original invisible people of the Pikes Peak region. <clears throat> so John's original book um, covers historical events from the 1920s to the 1980s. And this included the visits from Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey. There was an incident at Prospect Lake and also it documents the numerous discrimination lawsuits filed here in the Springs against various establishments. And this book also provides details of notable figures like George Motley, who John actually stated that that was the first invisible person, Horace Shelby, who was the first police officer appointed in Colorado Springs, and the entire Shroud family, whose influences can still be seen to this day. And now I'm going to turn it over to Heather so she can discuss the new content and additions that were added to this reprint. Okay, hi everyone. Hopefully you can hear me all right. So as Takia said, um, I'm going to talk about some of the new material that we've added to the reprint of the Invisible People of the Pikes Peak region. And we'll start with images. Um, Kara, okay, thank you. Um, so the original book did have images in it, and we tried to include as many of those original images in the reprint as we could. Um, we did manage to get most of them, um, but we also added images um, to the new material as well as images to those original chapters. So on your screen, you can see a few examples of images that you'll find in the book. Um, on the left-hand side here, we have Vera Gang Scott. She was the first African-American um, to be a principal in the Colorado Springs public school system. Then we have Sam Hairston and his family. He played for the Sky Sox. Um, there's an image of John Holly. He is the author of our book. And then we have on the right-hand side, Reverend Dr. Milton E. Proby. He was pastor of the St. John's Baptist Church, and all the locals that are watching this probably also have driven on the Milton E. Proby Parkway. Um, so we received images from a lot of organizations as well as individuals that have family members in the book. So thank you to everyone that contributed images. I think they really do enhance the stories that the book has. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. We did include two original chapters to the reprint. Um, Takia wrote a chapter called The Power Couple of Colorado Springs. This chapter is about John Holly and Ruth Holly. And as she mentioned, she interviewed their son, Noel. Um, for the chapter, he also provided some images. And then I also have a chapter 
called Our Ancestors Are Calling. And this is about the founding of the Negro Historical Association of Colorado Springs and the African American Historical and Genealogical Society of Colorado Springs. And the president and CEO of that society, Candace McKnight, was kind enough to allow me to interview her for the chapter. She also fact checked the chapter for me, um, as well as provided images. So a huge thank you to Candace for helping us get that chapter together. And we did have images um, that were not in the original put in both of these chapters. So we wanted to find a way to include information on people that were not originally in the book. And our way of doing that was by creating what we're calling snapshots. And these are brief one to two page biographies on people and groups in the community that made an impact. Um, these were created with the help of Melissa Mitchell, who will be uh, speaking in just a few minutes after myself. So thank you, Melissa, for your help with that. Um, a few examples of our snapshots include the all-black baseball team, the Brown Bombers. Uh, we have Clarence Shivers, who was a Tuskegee Airman pilot, as well as an artist. And you can see an example of his snapshot on the screen here. We also have Pamela Butler, who was with the Colorado Springs Fire Department. Um, obviously, there are a lot of people we wanted to include, but we simply couldn't because of the size of the book but hopefully the people that we did include are interesting to those of you that end up purchasing or checking out the book. So go to the next slide. Okay, so we did include a few reprinted items as well. Um, Takia mentioned Ashley Cornelius. Um, we included a poem by her called For Ruth. Um, she originally presented this at the rededication ceremony of the Ruth Holly Branch back in 2019. And we've included that at the beginning of the book. We also have a chapter by Kay Esmail on the very fascinating Fannie Mae Duncan and the Cotton Club called Chasing the American Dream. And this is reprinted from another library publication called Enterprise and Innovation in the Pikes Peak region. Um, and there's also a lot of really great photos in there too. So thank you to Kay um, for allowing us to reprint that chapter. The library conducts, on occasion, oral history interviews, and Takia and I decided to include two of those interviews in the reprint. Um, so in the book, you'll find an oral history interview with Vera Gang Scott, who I had mentioned earlier, was a school principal. Um, this was conducted back in 1993 by Mary Davis. Um, and we also have an oral history interview with Roosevelt Collins, who was an athletic director for Colorado College. He was also the first African-American hired at Colorado College in a non-janitorial or non-domestic role. Um, those are both really interesting interviews. They have a lot of great stories to tell about Colorado Springs. And we did add images to both of those, Im um, both of those interviews. Um, Colorado College donated the Roosevelt Collins photos. So thank you um, to Colorado College for that. The original book does not have an index, so that's another thing that we added to this book. Um, so you will be able to now search by topic or by a person's name and find them um, quickly in the book. So hopefully everyone finds that useful. And the book also has a chronology at the end, and we have included a few events that took place after the original publication date. So that has also been um, updated. So hopefully you guys are interested in purchasing this book. If you are, our main seller is Clausen Books. You can go directly to their website, which is clausenbooks.com. If you purchase the book um, between today and the 18th, you can get it um, for $21. That includes a 15% discount, free shipping, and the tax. So if you're planning on purchasing it, I would recommend doing it. Um, over the course of the next week. You can also get it at the Special Collections Library um, that is located downtown on Cascade. We do only take cash or check though, so keep that in mind. Um, the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum gift shop also will be selling the book, and they are also downtown um, on Tejong. Um, we do plan on releasing an ebook version of this, 
Um, and we're also going to work on an audiobook version of this, which is something totally new for us. Um, so as soon as those are available, we will make that information public and hopefully you guys can go ahead and uh, get those versions. If you don't want to purchase the book, but you want to read the book, we will also have copies available to check out at the Pikes Peak Library District. You just need your library card and you can get those um, for free to read. So now that we've talked about the book, uh, we're going to move on to our presenters. We have two featured presenters today. Um, our first presenter is Melissa Mitchell, and I'm just going to read a brief bio on Melissa, and then we will go ahead and get started. Melissa is a Colorado native. She grew up in Colorado Springs and graduated from the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. While in college, she worked as an assistant excuse me, she worked as a library assistant at the Community Center Library at the Air Force Academy, where she fell in love with working in a library. After graduating from UCCS, she attended Emporia State University, where she obtained her master's degree in library science. Melissa works for the Pikes Peak Library District as a senior adult services librarian with an emphasis on adult programming. When she's not working, she enjoys spending time with her friends and her kitten Eve. She enjoys knitting, riding her bike, going to the movies, cooking and baking, and of course, reading. Please welcome Melissa as she presents Growing Up With Greatness. Uh, Melissa, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I knew I was gonna do that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Heather, for your great introduction, and I'm honored to be here tonight. Um, when I was working on my presentation, I had to come up with the title, and I came up with Growing Up With Greatness, but I think it can also be called Our History Connects Us. I want to start off with a quote that I found in a newspaper clipping, clipping that one of my parents had saved. Unfortunately, I don't have the date but the article was from the Colorado Springs Free Press and it was written by Paula Wallace. Uh, next slide, please. And the article was called 20th Century Women and it was talking about Dorothy Bass Span and how her family were true natives of Colorado. And the quote says, Pages of Colorado Springs history resound with the names like Palmer, Stratton, Hagerman, and Halbert, white pioneers and founding fathers who helped bring civilization to the wilderness. Very little is said about the black pioneers who also came with dreams when the West was young and growing and added their contributions to Colorado. I'm very thankful to John Hawley for documenting the legacy of the Black pioneers and history makers of Colorado Springs and the invisible people of the Pikes Peak region. And I'm also thankful to Takia and Heather for keeping the history alive with the newly updated edition of the book. I never would have guessed that I would have been asked to help with the invisible people, much less be one of the speakers tonight. It started a few years ago when I moved um, my job from the East Library to the Penrose Library. I met Takia and we became fast friends. Our offices, our desks were up on the second level at Penrose, so we would see each other and chat and have, um, and Takia would come over to my desk. Um, it's a running joke that she has her own candy jar at my desk that I keep filled at all times. But I would ask her what was going on with special collections being a programming library and I thought there could be some kind of program um, tie-ins. And then one day Takia told me that she and Heather were updating the invisible people and I thought that was so fantastic. I was happy for them. I'm happy for special collections. And more importantly, I'm happy for our community because it's much needed history that everyone needs to know. 
And as she was working on the book, she would mention someone's name and I would say, oh, that's a family friend or, oh, I knew them growing up from church. And then one day she um, came to me and she said she wanted me to help contribute to the book. And I said, thank you, but I'm not an academic type like everyone is in special collections and I'm not really a writer. And she gave me the look and you don't want the look from Takiya. And she said to me, can you write a sentence? Yes. Can you write, put those sentences in a paragraph? Yes. Well, then you're a writer and this is what you need, I want you to do. So I was very, very excited to contribute a few of the snapshots that are found throughout the book. But then when Takia texted me a few weeks ago on a Saturday and said, I have a very important question for you. Um, I was like, hmm, I wonder what important question she has for me. And she asked me to be one of the speakers for tonight. And I said a tentative yes, but then I told her she should really ask Sharon Tenson to speak because she'd be dynamite and really great at it. I had no idea that she had already asked Sharon to speak. And one of these connections is, is Sharon is a family friend. And I know when she comes up for her turn that she's going to be a dynamite speaker tonight. But here I am and I'm honored to be here. My dad, Herman B. Mitchell, was in the, um, the Army and retired at Fort Carson when I was just a toddler. He and my mom, Nancy, decided Colorado Springs would be a good place to raise me and my older brother, Peter. And next slide, please. And these are just some of my favorite pictures of growing up and being with my brother, Peter. And since I've been here my whole life, I've seen the community, community grow and I know lots of the history. Oh, but while I was working on this presentation tonight and looking through family photos and newspaper clippings, I realized that my family has a connection to the Black history of the Pikes Peak region. It made me realize I couldn't see the forest because of the trees. Some of the history makers mentioned in the book were family friends. I knew them from church or from them coming over to visit with my parents. It's only now that I realize that they were extraordinary and they helped make Colorado Springs and the Pikes Peak region what it is today. And I'm very thankful for them for touching my life and having an influence on me. One of the bigger influences on me was not from a person, but from an institution, Payne Chapel AME Church. And it, when you get the book and you read in the book, you'll find out that Payne Chapel was the first established church for um, people of color in Colorado Springs. Um, my parents were active in the church, more so my dad than my mom, and me and my brother as children um, grew up in the church. We were baptized, we went to vacation Bible school, picnics, did everything the church had to offer. I was talking to, with my brother Peter about the book and telling him that I was going to be contributing to it. And he reminded me that Samuel C. Hunter was his godfather. And every Sunday after church, Mr. Hunter gave Peter 25 cents. And this will be showing my age, but back then, 25 cents got you lots of candy at 7-Eleven. And then across the street from Payne Chapel was a grocery store called Sims. And they had like the best sugar cookies. So you could get a couple of the sugar cookies for 25 cents. Not that Peter shared very often with me. So in The Invisible People, when you get your copy, you'll learn that Samuel C. Hunter Sr. was Colorado Springs' first African-American mortician and owner of Hunter Mortuary. His son, Samuel Jr., took over the business, and um, I will always remember him for overseeing the um, funeral arrangements for 
my parents. And when my dad passed away, Peter had asked him if it was weird for him to bury his friends. And Mr. Hunter said, no, it was an honor for him. And I know that Mr. Hunter knew that we were very thankful to him. And he made a difficult time in our lives a little easier. One of my other fond memories from Payne Chapel, next slide. Oh, that's a, a slide of my family. We were in the newspaper for Easter Sunday and my dad was very active in the church choir and he was in the church choir with Sharon's grandmother. So sorry, I didn't say to advance the slides, but next slide. Oh, and then I talked about the hunters, sorry. And now I'm on my slide that's with my presentation. Sorry about that. Um, one of my fond memories from being a child at Payne Chapel was Dorothy Bass Spann. I remember sitting with um, Mrs. Spann in her pew, as well as visiting her home as a little girl. Um, her daughter, um, Dorothy Ann, was the organist for the church, and I can even remember um, inviting myself to sit with her as she accompanied the choir. I'm not sure why I did that, but I did. Um, but Dorothy Bassman, she's like one of the nicest people that you'd ever want to meet. And um, what I didn't know about her when I was younger was that she lived at Glen Erie, where her father, Jesse Bass, was the horse trainer for Gen General William Jackson Palmer, and that she was also a leading um, pioneer for civil rights in Colorado Springs. I just have very fond memories of her. And, you know, as a child, I had no idea that she had such an influence on Colorado Springs. Next slide. And, and this is a picture of my family, along with John McDonald, who's Sharon's dad, who she will talk about later. And my dad went to like every church conference that was, he went to them all. And this one, we were going to Atlanta, Georgia for the church conference. And it was a special trip because my dad is was from Georgia. And so we were getting a chance to see where he came from. And John McDonald joined us on the very long road trip to Atlanta. And it was a really fun trip. And this was like right before we took off and we were pointing south because that's where we were headed. And Mr. McDonald, John McDonald was a um, very nice person. I remember his very calm demeanor as well as that of his wife, Erda Mae McDonald. And one of my memories of uh, Mrs. McDonald is that if I were out in my yard working and she was driving by, she would always stop and talk to me. And like one time I was out doing yard work, mowing the lawn, and this person did this wild U-turn in the street. And I was like, who is that person? What are they doing? And it was Mrs. McDonald and she stopped to say hi and talk to me. So I will always remember her wonderful smile. Next slide. Um, as I said, my dad was very active with Payne Chapel until his death in 2001. Um, he was on the church's board. He helped guide the finance committee. He was in the choir. He counted the money after church. Every Sunday made the deposit. He really did a lot. And um, he was an active member in the lay organization for Payne Chapel. And in um, 2016, he along with Sam Hunter Sr. and Jr., as well as Barbara Hunter Mendez, were honored in the lay organization conferences um, pamphlet that's there on the, in the blue. And it's thanks to Payne Chapel that I'm an employee of the Pikes Peak Library District. It's kind of a roundabout way, but 
One of the members and a family friend named Barbara Meekins helped me get my first professional job as a librarian. She helped me get a job at Lyman Correctional Facility, which is a long way from the Pikes Peak Library District. But ever since I wanted to be a librarian, I had always wanted to work at the Penrose Library. The Penrose Library is the one that I grew up using. And I remember many times taking the city bus downtown with my best friend Karen to get books. And then we'd always stop at Mrs. Fields to get a little treat. And, but at my job at Lyman Correctional Facility, I gained some valuable professional experience and finally a job came open and I got hired at the East Library. And it was at the East Library where I met Peggy and Clarence Shivers. You know, whenever they come to East to work on one of their events, like the Shedding Light celebration, they'd always say hello and chat with me. And one time I asked Peggy Shivers, because I knew she was an opera singer, but I had to ask her if she was a for real opera singer. And she was like, yes, I'm a for real opera singer. But in Clarence and Peggy are very nice. And it, I'm amazed at all of the they have done for the Pikes Peak Library District. The Shivers African American Historical and Cultural Collection is a huge asset to our community. Even though I had always wanted to work at the Penrose Library, I'm glad that I worked at the East Library. As an African-American librarian, I'm very proud to follow in the footsteps of Ruth Holly, who, as John mentioned, was the first African-American branch supervisor for the Pikes Peak Library District at the original East Library in 1973. Along with Heather and Takia, we know that we can't fill Ruth Holly's shoes, but we can carry on her legacy with our work. In closing, by doing this presentation, as I mentioned before, it made me realize how all of our history is connected. Next slide, please. I would told my neighbor, Mrs. Shirley Frazier, about doing this program. And she told me a story that I never knew about. And she's been my neighbor my whole life. And during this pandemic, we've actually grown closer together. But the story that she told me was that when she was growing up, in, her dad worked for Metropolitan Life Insurance. And many of his clients were from the African-American community. And one of his clients was Fannie Mae Duncan. And she told me how like sometimes she would go with him to collect their life insurance money. And she's like, back then it was like 15 or 20 cents. And then she said that her parents got to know Fannie Mae Duncan and would go to the Cotton Club. And like I said, I've known her my whole life and I never knew that about her. And it made me show, made me realize how connected we are by our history. Next slide, please. Once again, I'd like to thank Heather and Takia for giving me the opportunity to help with the invisible people of the Pikes Peak region and to be a part of the festivities tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Melissa, for that wonderful presentation. And also now you need to hide my candy jar because everybody knows about it. <laughs> so thank you. Our, <laughs> thank you. Um, our next speaker is Sharon McDonald Tunson. Sharon is a second generation native of Colorado Springs. She attended schools in District 11 and graduated from Palmer High School. Following high school graduation, Sharon attended the University of Northern Colorado in Greenlee, where she graduated with a bachelor's degree in communications. She was a teacher, a counselor, and an administrator in Colorado Springs District 11 for 32 years. She received a master's in education with the emphasis on diverse learners from the University of Phoenix and her principal's license from the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. She is currently the Assistant Dean of High School Programs at Pikes Peak Community College. 
Sharon is also a member of Payne Chapel AME Church, where she serves as the co-chair of the steward board, the Colorado Springs alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and the African American Genealogical and Historical Association, uh, excuse me, Historical Society of Colorado Springs. Sharon is also the proud mom, uh, mother of Erica Tunson, who is currently the principal at Monterey Elementary School in Harrison School District 2. Go ahead, Black Girl Magic. Everyone welcome Sharon McDonald Tunson. Thank you, Takia, and thank you to everyone uh, on the call tonight. I am so happy to be here and talk about the very rich history of Colorado Springs. All of us talk about what we do know about Colorado Springs. It's scenic, it's beautiful, and the climate is great, which is what drew a lot of the original settlers, black and white, to Colorado Springs, along with the gold that was found uh, on the side of Pikes Peak. We know that Catherine uh, Bates wrote America the Beautiful after seeing um, Pikes Peak. We know that Zebulon Pike uh, founded that mountain. So let's talk about what we do not know probably about Colorado Springs. I am proud to say that I'm a second generation native of Colorado Springs. My mother, Erna May Marshall McDonald, and my father, John Morrison McDonald, were born in Colorado Springs. I attended Bristol Elementary School, as did so many of the families who are in the invisible people of the Pikes Peak region, the Colberts, the Strouds. We went to Bristol Elementary School, North Junior High School, and Colorado Springs High School, which is now William J. Palmer High School, as did my mother. My grandfather, Eugene Marshall, also attended Bristol once he arrived in Colorado Springs. My father lived on the South Side and attended Lowell Elementary School, South Junior High School, where I later taught English and civics, and Colorado Springs High School, which is now, of course, Palmer. His family came to Colorado Springs from Mexico, Missouri. And this is my grandfather, uh, Nathaniel McDonald, on the screen right now. And my grandmother, Bertha Lucille McDonald, came to Colorado Springs from Winfield, Kansas, to work as a nanny for a white family who came to Colorado Springs because the father of the family had tuberculosis. At that time in this resort town, which was Colorado Springs, many people came because the climate was uh, helpful to those who were suffering from tuberculosis. I grew up on the west side of Colorado Springs on Spruce Street, I was surrounded by seven cousins and my grandfather three doors down and eight cousins and my aunt and uncle, my father's brother, a block away on Pine Street and friends of different ethnicities, the Manzanares family who lived right behind us, the Litchfield family who lived across the street, the Colbert family who lived on Walnut Street, the Morgan family and the Stroud family. What a blessing it was to know my grandparents and to get to hear the oral history of our family and life in Colorado Springs through their eyes. We attended Payne Chapel AME Church where my grandmother, Bertha McDonald, served as an organist there for 60 years. And my paternal grandfather, Nathaniel McDonald on the screen here, attended People's United Methodist Church. We lived a block away from Morgan Memorial Church of God in Christ and went to Sunday school there when it snowed and we couldn't get to Payne Chapel. At church, I met so many of the heroes and sheroes mentioned in this book. So I decided to entitle my present tonight, presentation tonight, The Unsettled Settlers. These are the people who fought for their place in Colorado Springs from the moment they arrived. And the picture of Payne Chapel, that was the original building on the left and uh, the building after some renovations on the right was a jumping off place for many of the uh, protests and powwows of the people who were talking about what they were going to do to make uh, Colorado Springs great. So one of the things is that, that we all need to remember is that black men traveled through what is now the state of Colorado and the Pikes Peak region as far back as the 16th century, according to the historian John Hope Franklin. One black man, Estevanico, 
uh, known as Little Stephen, was an outstanding explorer of the southwestern states. But with the discovery of gold in 1858, a few black freedmen moved into the region. And Colorado Springs being laid out in 1871 by General William Jackson Palmer, who was a veteran of the Union Army, and who through his writings um, should said that he wanted to plan a city that people could live in wherever they wanted in integrated communities. Colorado Springs was laid out in 1871 and we celebrate the 150th anniversary of our city this year. And next year, Payne Chapel AME Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church, will celebrate 150 years as well of our founding, which was in 1872. So uh, General Palmer donated the land, this land on Pueblo Avenue to establish Payne Chapel. It was founded, as I said, in 1872 by the Carter brothers, Isaiah, John, Oliphant, and Thomas, pioneers who came here from Iowa, who arrived in Colorado Springs in 1872 when Colorado was still a territory. The very first established Christian community for people of color in Colorado Springs was this building right here, Payne Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. This family formed the nucleus from which sprung Payne Chapel, named for the presiding bishop of the time, Bishop Daniel A. Payne. The first services were held in the home of Mr. and Mrs. I.S. Carter, and they lived right behind where the church is there on Weber. And through the efforts of J.S. Carter, the land at 128 Pueblo Avenue was donated by General Palmer, president of the Colorado Springs Company and founder of Colorado Springs. The frame structure was built on this site with Reverends Hatton and Friston and 12 faithful members who were successful in keeping the church open and active. This church cost $6,000 in 1889 and uh, the U.S. Corps of Engineers hewed the stones from the quarry in Bear Creek Canyon at no cost and then the stones were then transported by horse and wagon by the church members. One of Payne Chapel's first trustees was George Rollins, whose daughter Eliza became the first black graduate of Colorado Springs High School, again, which is now Palmer High School. My family has been affiliated with Payne Chapel from the early 1900s when my grandparents moved to Colorado Springs. The church was renovated in 1969 and sold in 1986. And the church now is located, Payne Chapel AME Church is located at 3625 Marion Drive. My dad grew up in a house located at the corner of Weber and Rio Grande Street in South Colorado Springs and told us the story of sitting on his back porch on Weber Street across from where the police operations center now stands and watching the Ku Klux Klan burn crosses on what they call Motorcycle Hill. The Colorado Springs branch of the NAACP was founded in Payne Chapel in 1918. My paternal grandfather, which you saw in an earlier slide, Nathaniel McDonald, told me about the visit of Marcus Garvey and his wife, Amy, visiting People's United Methodist in 1922, where he talked about the Back to Africa movement. I remember my grandfather saying that he was not going back to Mexico, Missouri, where he was from, or where in back to Africa, he was gonna stay right here. My mother's family, which was back a couple of slides, um, came to Colorado Springs, there they are, from uh, Kansas and Kentucky. My grandfather and his family came uh, in a covered wagon from Owensboro, Kentucky. And they came because one of their daughters had uh, come to Colorado Springs with her husband and they bought land. Uh, his grandparents who were right there in the center, Jane and Piper Logan, and the aunts bought, west, bought land on the west side of Colorado Springs where the King Super on Uinta now stands. In the book, The Black Pioneers, Dorothy Baspin tells the history of her family. She says that Charles, her great grandfather was a former slave who fought for the North in the Civil War and Amanda was a runaway slave who had found her way to New Mexico before the war. The two met and married in New Mexico and moved their family to Colorado Springs in the mid 1880s. In the early 1900s, one of their children, Mosey, lived at Glen Airy in General Palmer's estate where her husband, 
Mosey's husband, Jesse Bass, groomed General Palmer's horses until General Palmer's death in 1909. This was a story I heard as a child from Dorothy Bass Band herself, who was a member of Payne Chapel AME Church. General Palmer's daughters were named Dorothy, Elsie, and Marjorie, and the Bass daughters were also Dorothy, Elsie, Elsie, and Marjorie, and then Jessie Lou, who was named for her grandfather. Colorado Springs grew after the Civil War and was populated by a large number of white settlers from the South. So General Palmer's vision of a beautiful city where everyone lived together and had equal rights didn't last long. By the late 1870s, Black people were not being served in restaurants and could not stay in hotels. My mother told me that a Black doctor, Dr. Isaac Edward Moore, lived in a big house on Spruce Street across the street from where I grew up and he rented out rooms to Black travelers in what became known as the Colored Hotel and was listed in the Green Book, which you'll find um, in this new edition of Invisible People. Though the Colorado legislature passed a law in 1885 prohibiting racial discrimination in places of public accommodation. My parents told us stories about growing up in Colorado Springs. They told us that the schools and neighborhoods were integrated, but they had to sit in the balcony or the back rows of theaters, and they could only use the swimming pool on Wednesdays because Wednesday night was when they drained and cleaned the pool. My uncle was in the marching band at Colorado Springs High School, and the band was selected to play in Chicago. My uncle could not ride in the train with car with his classmates, nor stay in the hotel with them when they reached Chicago. He had to find a colored rooming house in the city of Chicago. I remember hearing stories about a woman named Gretchen McRae who lived on South Weber. She and her family attended Payne Chapel as well. She graduated from Colorado Springs High School and moved to Washington, DC, where she was involved in the fight against racial segregation as a federal worker in Washington, DC. She returned to Colorado Springs when her grandmother became ill and began a publication of a magazine called A Free Republic, which talked about gaining rights for all people, equal rights for all people. She ran for the Colorado Springs City Council in 1946. There were seven candidates and she was finished in seventh place, but she ran in 1946. She continued writing articles and fighting discrimination upon her return to Colorado Springs. The family of Esther and Anna Morgan lived on the west side of Colorado Springs, where the family home still is today on Pine Street. The family had 10 children, two of whom were members of the Brown Bomber baseball team, which will be featured again in the new Invisible People, Justice and Joseph. I had a conversation with Joe Morgan uh, a few years, a couple of years before he died, when he came out to the college to talk about being a member of the Brown Bombers baseball team. And he told this story. He said, I grew up knowing and respecting all of the men who are a part of the, uh, who are a part of the team. He had friends and they went to have a milkshake, white friends, he said, and they went to Woolworths to have a milkshake at the counter. And the waiter, poured a whole shaker of salt into his milkshake. So Joe refused to pay for that milkshake. And the police were called. And when the police called, he said that the, one of the policemen tasted the milkshake and said, I wouldn't pay for it either. So he left. But one of the unsettled settlers fighting in 1947 is when this happened, he told me, uh, fighting for uh, their rights to sit down and simply have a milkshake with his friends. So I grew up knowing and respecting many of the men who were brown bombers and my father talked about it because my brothers were baseball players. And Joe Morgan shared that story with me about that in 1947. So even though General Palmer's dream of a city where equality for all was the dream, the unsettled settlers of Colorado Springs have always fought back to try to make that dream a reality. My parents bought a house on the west side of Colorado Springs on Spruce Street, 741 North Spruce. They told us that when they decided to purchase a home, they were told that they were only certain neighborhoods they could consider when buying a home in Colorado Springs in 1947. Though, remember, Colorado had passed 
a law banning discrimination in public accommodations and housing in 1885. The unsettled settlers pursued their dream of home ownership. Growing up in Colorado Springs in the 60s, I was the only black student in most of my classes at Bristol Elementary School, North Junior High and Palmer. I participated in a march of about 500 people in 1963 that began at Payne Chapel and ended on the steps of City Hall for a service in memory of the four girl, little girls who were killed at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The president of the local NAACP, Samuel Hunter Jr., applied for a parade permit to march to the city hall and was denied that permit by the city manager. He granted them a parade permit, which only allowed us to march a block away from city hall. He announced that the permit was for a parade and not the march. The city manager reversed his ruling when Mr. Hunter received a statement from the attorneys for the Colorado Wyoming Conference of the NAACP that said public property must be available for public assembly based on the Supreme Court ruling. We all rejoiced when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 became the law of the land. Race discrimination in Colorado Springs was a thing of the past, we thought. However, Blacks were still aware that our presence in certain areas of town was not welcomed. The Urban League came to Colorado Springs in 1965 and assisted Blacks in housing and employment. In 1964, I became the first Black cheerleader in Colorado Springs at William J. Palmer High School. There's a slide of that somewhere. And uh, I was elected the first queen in Colorado Springs High Schools when I was elected sweetheart queen and gained a mention in the first invisible people of the Pikes Peak region. I met John Holly and his wife Ruth shortly after their arrival in Colorado Springs. I was a student at Colorado State College in Greeley, Colorado and was teaching black history classes at Payne Chapel for young people. And Mr. Holly was a speaker at one of my classes. We marched again from Payne Chapel AME Church to Acacia Park in 1967 in a march that was a witness for racial unity and progress, an event organized by the Urban League and local churches, black and white following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1968. Colorado Springs gathered again at the Broadmoor International Center for a memorial service and a renewed dedication to equality and nonviolence. We keep trying. In 1969, Floyd Petty became the first black elected to the Colorado Springs City Council. Vera Gang Scott became the first black school principal in Colorado Springs. Ruth Holly became the first black supervisor of Colorado Springs Library in 1975. Norvell Simpson became the first black person elected to the Board of Education in District 11. In 1981, Leon Young became vice mayor of Colorado Springs. In 1985, Delia Armstrong Busby became the first black secondary school principal in Colorado Springs. And about that time in 19, late 1980s, a suit was filed against Colorado Springs District 11 in which I testified, uh, Dr. Pamela Shipp testified and Delia Busby testified. And that had an impact on the hiring practices in District 11 to this day. In 1987, Dr. Kenneth Stephen Burnley became the first black school superintendent in Colorado Springs. And in 2018, Dr. Michael Thomas became the second black superintendent of school district 11 schools. Colorado Springs has come a long way. We have at least four black doctors or more, black dentists, a black veterinarian even. We've gone from Horace Shelby, the only black police officer in the city, in 1885 to 25 African-American police officers. There are African-American firefighters, two African-American district court judges, and the numerous churches throughout the city. The African-American population in Colorado Springs is about 6.1%. But the unsettled settlers of Colorado Springs took to the streets again in 2019 to protest the treatment of African-Americans at the hands of the police following the shooting of Devon Bailey by police officers and the Colorado Springs City Council approved the Law Enforcement Transparency and Accountability Commission to make recommendations regarding police procedures in the city. As a native of Colorado Springs, I have been blessed 
to hear some of the stories from the people who lived these stories. The unsettled settlers of the Pikes Peak region who came to this city and this state looking for opportunity and expecting to be treated as equal citizens because of a forward thinking Colorado legislature that on paper outlined discrimination hundreds of years ago. These brave men and women continued to march, pray, establish businesses, serve their country, run for office, become policemen and firefighters, pastors, teachers, school principals, school superintendents, college professors and presidents, public servants, elected officials, preachers, athletes, unsettled settlers who reside in this great city and continue to fight for all of us, all of us to be allowed to settle here, to live here, to thrive here, and to be seen. We are no longer the invisible people of the Pikes Peak region. Thank you so much. Takia. Oh, thank you so much for that, Sharon. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Kara, who is going to take over. Hi, Kara. Hi, everyone. <laughs> wow, Sharon, that was just so wonderful and powerful. Thank you so much. And Melissa, thank you so much for sharing about your family and experiences and memory. And to Kia and Heather, thank you for your hard work and to all those involved to uh, re-release this book that really uh, needed that attention and um, needs to be out there right now. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to um, join us again on April 15th, another Thursday at seven o'clock Mountain Standard Time. We'll be doing a Colorado Springs History Book Club featuring invisible people. And so that will give you hopefully a little time to take a look at that book. Um, and then we'll have time to talk with both Takia and Heather and learn a little bit more about their um, process in um, kind of making invisible people available to us and adding all of this great new content. So we hope that you can join us for that. Um, you can register on ppld.org, just click on calendar and then you can find the program and find more details and register there. And then once again, I have some information up here just um, about purchasing if you're interested in those options, either from Clausen Books, um, from us at Special Collections, or um, from the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. So I just want to thank all of you for coming and joining us today, all of our wonderful speakers for being here to share their experience and work. And um, they're just wonderful memories and helping us learn just more about our, our community's history and um, sharing stories that need to be told. So thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. We'll see you hopefully for another program soon. Thank you.